والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على افضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد we begin with allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings this night here in masjid shah alam in kuala lumpur in malaysia for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam our subject is entitled the imperative of the muslim village everybody here know that the word kampung means village For those who are going to be listening to this lecture outside of Malaysia would not know it. Kampung village, the imperative of the Muslim kampung. We begin with the observation that we live in strange times when for the first time in human history all the villages are being left behind and people are flocking to the cities and the cities are growing bigger and bigger until now we have something known as the mega city with not just 1 million people and 5 million people some of them have 10 million some have 20 million people in a city why is this happening is this movement from the countryside to the cities taking place by accident or is there something which explains it we in islam we say we have an explanation and that explanation is located in the branch of knowledge connected with akhirul zaman in english they call it islamic eschatology and tonight we will attempt to explain why there is this movement from the countryside to the city and why we want to move in the opposite direction Our subject is divided into three parts. In the first, the explanation why why should we move to the countryside, to the kampung, or the rationale. In the second part, we will look at the structure. of the village the muslim village and in the third what are the functions of the muslim village which justify our movement from the city back to the village tonight we will not address the structure we have done that in previous lectures tonight we will look at the rationale why 
and look at the functions. The structure is a subject which can be studied in a book written by my teacher, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, in two volumes entitled The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. What is, it, what is it that explains this movement? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us in the Quran and you are all aware of it. That when he sent Adam alayhi salam from Jannah to live on earth, he and his wife, he said, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرْنٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَىٰ حِينٌ That the earth will sustain human life for only a certain period of time. The earth will not sustain human life forever. In Surah Al-Kahf, we are told something even more. And Surah Al-Kahf, or you say Surah Al-Kahfi, is the Surah of the Qur'an, Parak Silas, which explains Akhir zaman or Islamic eschatology. And Nabi, Muh Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam told us to recite the first ten ayat of Surah al kahfi for protection from the fitna of the Dajjal. So you must memorize it, particularly when you have to go to immigration. <laughs> and in those ten ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْعَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That we have provided this earth and all its beauty and all its ornaments to test you, to see which of you is best in conduct, most righteous, which of you will not tolerate oppression, which of you will not stand idle when Allah's laws are being trampled upon? Which of you will have restlessness in your heart when you see godlessness in the world? When you see decadence in the world? Which of you is best in conduct? And then he went he then went on to say, That one day we will transform this earth into a dust hole, a barren dust hole. There is a hadith connected with the Dajjal in which the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam prophesied that in the time of the job, Allah will what withhold one third of the rain the first year and as a consequence one third of the crops will not grow this does not have to be twelve months this could be one period of time. And then he said, Allah will then in a second day, a second year, withhold two-thirds of the rain. And as a consequence, two-thirds of the crops will not grow. And we know that the Dajjal has control over climate. We know that. Because the Dajjal 
will come to a people and they would follow him mostly in Singapore <laughs> and uh, he will cause the rain to fall and the cattle will come home with their humps high the people would prosper and then the jar will go to another people mostly in Afghanistan Somalia and they would refuse to follow him and the jar will stop the rain from falling and the cattle will come home at evening lean and thin and these people would suffer so there is such a thing as control over climate and preventing the rain from falling and then said the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam that in the third year Allah will prevent the rain from falling completely no rain and therefore no crops and therefore the earth will be reduced Sa'id and Juruza, a dust bowl, barren dust bowl, dust bowl. And the companions ask, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how will we survive at that time? And he said that Subhanallah will become sustenance, and Alhamdulillah will become sustenance. And Allahu Akbar will become sustenance. And that needs to be penetrated. That statement needs to be understood. How can Subhanallah become food? We now come to a very important verse. In Surah Al Isra, in which we now focus upon towns and cities. Allah says in Surah Al Isra, Ma'alehuz Billahi min Shaitan Al Rajim, Wa Im min Qariyatin illa. نحن مخلقوها قبل يوم القيامة أو معذبوها عذابا شديدا كان ذلك في الكتاب مصدورا and not a single town not a single city not a single قرية will escape but that we will destroy them all Allah's punishment when Allah destroys, He destroys because of His anger. He punishes. And those towns and cities which escape destruction will be punished with terrible punishment. I don't know whether the Security Council of the United Nations approves of this verse of the Quran or not. Because you see, they say they rule the world. Those that escape destruction would be punished with terrible punishment. <laughs> and this is something inscribed in the book. And it will come to pass in Akhirul Zaman. And so we need to study the subject of Islamic eschatology. But there is a means of escape from that terrible end that we are approaching. The Prophet ﷺ told us that the time will come when a man would have to flee to the mountain sides where rain falls and take with him some sheep and goats 
Why? First of all, to preserve Deen. Because you cannot preserve your Deen in the cities. No. He said, if you live at that time, hold on to your land and hold on to your animals. So if you have money made of paper, I think you're familiar with it, money made from paper, <laughs> you might want to take that paper and put it in land and put it in animals because the paper leaks, you know. And then a man asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what about if I do not have land and I do not have animals, what should I do? He said, sharpen your sword. Why? Because the world is going to descend into anarchy, people living like animals. And you need your sword to survive. But finally, in Surah al kahf of the Qur'an, there is hope. That when you see the world moving in that direction, there is universal shirk, for example. What do you do? Do you remain there until Allah destroys? No, what they did, the young men in Surah al kahfi of the Qur'an, وَإِذِ اَتَزَلْتُمُّهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ فَأُوْ إِلَى الْكَحْفِ They fled to the cave. They disconnected from the godless world. They disconnected. They withdrew. And when they withdrew, they fled to the cave. Maybe to rest in the cave for a while before they Proceed further. And Allah says, When you do that, then there is an opening. There is hope for survival. Allah will shower you with His mercy. And so they survive. Because Allah caused them to survive. Why would Allah destroy all the towns and all the cities, including Kuala Lumpur? Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has zero tolerance for oppression. Islam, the religion, has zero tolerance for oppression. Today there is oppression all over the world. The most visible form of oppression is in the economy. And it is because of riba. Riba is not only lending and borrowing money on interest, and everybody is doing that now. All governments are doing that. All of them. Islamic or no Islamic. Islamic Republic or American Republic makes no difference. They're all borrowing and lending on interest. But riba is also transactions based on deception, which cause people to be ripped off. And they didn't eventually descend into poverty and destitution. That's where we are today. The world economy today is one in which everywhere in the world you have those who live in the comfort zone. 
those who are rich and who remain permanently rich those who are rich and who remain permanently rich and keep on growing richer and the rest of the masses who are imprisoned in permanent poverty forever and ever and keep on growing poorer destitute in the dust that is oppression when money no longer circulates to the economy and the rich remain permanently rich and the poor are imprisoned in permanent poverty that is oppression the poor are now exploited by the rich the poor nations are exploited by the rich nations and people now find themselves trapped in slave labor paid slave wages I was invited by a Malaysian telecommunications company the CEO invited me to address the staff and I asked I first told them well in Singapore my daughter is paid three hundred dollars she works as a domestic servant my Indonesian daughter and your Indonesian daughter they are your daughters and they are paid 300 Singaporean dollars to work like a dog and they paid the wage of a dog in that so-called bastion of democracy the model state of Singapore I asked a simple question and you should not threaten me with Guantanamo for asking that question is there any Singaporean girl who would work and do that work for that wage come on answer me Lee Kuai Yun the answer is no and therefore that is oppression and then I asked the CEO what is the wage paid to a domestic servant in KL he said 300 ringgits and then somebody said no you're wrong it's 400 ringgits and then a sister said no you're wrong it's 600 ringgits so I said let's stay with the six and then I asked is there any Malaysian woman who would do that work for that wage and the whole room responded and said no I said that's oppression and if you are oppressors and you are oppressing Allah will destroy you because Allah has zero tolerance for oppression when riba reduces the masses to poverty and destitution something else happens it's not just slave wages and slave labor something else in such an economy when people are destitute the ones who are most vulnerable are the ones who are hurt the most and who are those who are most vulnerable in, in Indonesia for example number one the woman and number two the children they are the ones who are most vulnerable and they are hurt the most and when women are oppressed then the heavens shake with thunder you oppress a man 
and you oppress a woman, it's not the same from above. Because Allah considers her to be weaker. And therefore you have a duty to protect her, not to exploit her. And so when women are oppressed, the punishment is more terrible. Can you imagine what are the consequences when children are oppressed? Which is what happens when you're on the gravy train, living in the comfort zone, and your gain is their labor, and their sweat, and their tears. All around the world today, that oppression exists, and it has incurred tremendous divine anger. If we believe that the heavens are smiling, we living in Disneyland. There is tremendous anger above. Allah destroyed people in the past. Every time He destroyed them, it was because of His anger with their conduct. In the economy of the Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam, there was riba. And Allah prohibited them. وَلَا تَرْخَصُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ Do not rip off people. And then Allah destroyed that community. Allah destroyed other people because they violated His commandments. They disobeyed Him. They were wicked in conduct. Their conduct was filthy. Their conduct was decadent. And filthiness of conduct, decadence of conduct brings punishment. Nabi Muhammad was asleep at the house of his wife Zainab and he saw something in a vision and it was terrible and he woke up and his face was flushed red. What did he see? He woke up with these words. وَيْلٌ لِلْعَرَبِ مِنْ شَرٍ قَدِكْ كَرَبَ Woe unto the Arabs because of a great evil which is now approaching. It is close. And then he raised his hand like this and made a circle and he said, Today a hole has been made in that radar built by Zulkarnain, the barrier. So Gog and Magog, or Ya'juj and Ma'juj are now going to be released in the lifetime of the Prophet and the Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. It is repeated in Sahih Bukhari several times. She asked, Yani Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, will we be destroyed, and Nuhlika, will we be destroyed? When there are righteous people living amongst us, that was a question. And the Prophet replied and he said, Naam, yes, the Arabs will be destroyed. And then he gave the time for it. He said, Ida kathur al khabas. When khabas prevails, then Allah's destruction will come. And so, Allah's punishment and Allah's destruction comes for so many different reasons. In the case of Banu Israel, it came because of their violation of a covenant with Allah. We are also a people, this Ummah. He, he created this Ummah as a special Ummah. And He said to us, Kuntum this ummah 
was created with a special covenant, a special mission. It is your duty to stand up for what is right. And if you don't, you violate your covenant with him. And it is your duty to stand up against what is wrong, regardless of consequences. And if you don't, you violate your covenant with him like Banu Israel did. And when Banu Israel violated their covenant with him and departed from the standard of righteous conduct, Allah destroyed Banu Israel. He destroyed the state of Israel. He destroyed Jerusalem. He expelled them. If you make halal what Allah made haram, as they did, Banu Israel, because Allah prohibited riba. But in the Torah, they changed the Torah. And the Torah now reads that it is haram for a Jew to lend money on interest to another Jew. That's haram. But it is halal, he can lend money on interest to those who are not Jews. We know that is false. We know that they changed the Torah. Because Allah responded in Surah An-Nisa. وَأَخْزِهِمُ riba. Allah says. They were taking riba. وَقَدْنُهُعَنْ Even though it had been prohibited to them. وَأَكْلِهِمْ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ بِالْبَاطِلِ And as a consequence, they were ripping off the people. So when you make halal what Allah made haram, you invite destruction from Allah and punishment from Allah. When you make legal what Allah made illegal, is it legal in Malaysia to lend money on interest? You answer that question to me. In fact, when we look back in the pages of religious history, we find that all the conditions which led to Allah's destruction, all are present now. And so the world today is ripe for Allah's destruction. Allah says in the Quran that He is a merciful God. He is Ar-Rahman, He is Ar-Rahim, He is Al-Ghaffar. He says in the Quran that He is prepared to forgive all sins. In Allah, Yaqfiru Zunuba Jama'at Jamia. Tell my servants, Hadith al Qudsi, that even if they come to me with sins as high as the clouds, as the sky, I will forgive them all. But there is one sin that Allah will not forgive. It is shirk. Today, anywhere you turn in the world, there is shirk. There is shirk in the political system. Because Allah is Al-Malik, the Sovereign. Malik is King, but for political terminology we must use the word Sovereign. Azan in five minutes? Sovereign. Modern Western civilization says no. And modern Western civilization emerged in Europe in consequence of a mysterious alliance between European Jews and European Christians. That mysterious alliance was anticipated in the Quran. The Quran tells us, لَا تَتَّخِذُ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ أَوْلِيَاءَ بَعْدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدُ Which means, do not take such Jews not all Jews, only such Jews. And do not take such Christians, not all Christians, only such Christians, as your friends and allies. 
who themselves become friends and allies of each other, who themselves become friends and allies of each other. Christians and Jews were never friends and allies. So the Qur'an is telling us that a time will come when this mysterious reconciliation will take place and a Jewish-Christian alliance will emerge. And the bond which bonded them together was Zionism. They are the ones who gave us modern Western civilization. And modern Western civilization gave us the modern secular state. In order to do that, it had to destroy the Khilafah, which is our political system, the Khilafah, which recognizes Allah as Al-Malik. And the modern secular state says Allah is not Al-Malik. Forget that. The modern state is Al-Malik. Sovereignty resides in the state. That is shirk. Those who don't believe me, wait until you get in your grave and then you'll know. The modern secular state says Allah is not Al-Akbar. Supreme authority resides with the state. You don't believe me? Wait until you go in your grave. The modern secular state says that Allah is not Al-Hakam, the supreme lawgiver. No. The state is now the supreme lawgiver. That is shirk. If you don't believe me, wait until you reach your grave and then you know. The modern secular state says, Allah can make it haram, but we can make it halal. And that is shirk. Where is the evidence? In Surah to tawbah اِتَّخَذُوا أَخْبَارَهُمْ وَرُحْبَانَهُمْ وَرْبَانَهُمْ دُونِ اللَّهِ They took their priests and rabbis as gods beside Allah. وَالْمَسِيحَ بْنَ مَرْيَمْ And they did the same with the Messiah, the son of Mary. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا يَعْبُدُوا إِلَهًا وَعِدًا But they had not been ordered other than to worship one God. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ There is no God beside Him. سُبْحَانَهُ Glory be to Him. عَمَّا يُشْرِكُمْ Far removed is from the, is he from the shirk? Which shirk? Taking your priests and rabbis as gods, lords, beside Allah. A man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, but the Christians do not worship their priests. And the Jews do not worship their rabbis. How could Allah say so? In Surah to Tawbah. To which the Prophet replied and said, Did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is sure. So if, if parliament, make, parliament makes halal what Allah made haram, would that not be sure? Huh? If the government makes halal what Allah made haram, would that not be sure? If you defer with me, wait until you reach your grave and then you'll know. And did the people not follow them in it? Defending, that is their shirk. There is shirk everywhere in the world today. The world is inundated with this political shirk. There, is, there are so many other forms of shirk in the world today. It is not only because of universal shirk in the world today that Allah is going to destroy every town and every city. In the Quran, we are told about the people of Lut alayhi salam. How they practice sexual perversion, homosexuality. And Allah has zero tolerance, zero tolerance. And so he destroyed them, Sodom and Gomorrah. The evidence is already here, clear, that the world is increasingly embracing homosexuality and lesbianism. In consequence of a feminist revolution, firstly, 
Allah created the male and the female to be attracted to each other. Where does He say so? He says so in Surah Al-Layl. He says, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى And by the night and that which it conceals <coughs> mysteriously, it shrouds. وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّ And by the day and its bright light, nothing concealed. وَمَا خَلَقَ الزَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى That in the same way that I created the night and the day, so too did I create the male and the female. Night and day are inseparable. Yes. When the day is coming to an end and is approaching the night, guess what happens? The excitement, the riot of colors, the sunset, a ball of fire. That's the excitement. So the attraction between the male and the female is something ordained by nature. By nature. It is part of the splendor of life, the mystery of life, the charm of life, which makes life so beautiful. That when you marry and the night and day come together, you get a piece of heaven right here on earth. So you're not married yet, make sure you get married quickly. <laughs> you get a piece of heaven right here on earth. Hmm? But now, from modern Western civilization, a modern feminist revolution, which in essence is saying that the night does not have to remain night. Anything a man does, a woman should have the freedom to also do it. And as a consequence, the night, well in Singapore the night has already become day. In France the night has already become day. In Malaysia the night is making progress to become day. In Indonesia they're going some problems. They're having some problems in Indonesia for the night to become day. The Indonesian woman is still so much a woman. As the night becomes day, the day is no longer attracted to the night. Because woman loses her femininity. She becomes more masculine than feminine. In her facial features, in her conduct. She becomes more masculine than feminine. And men are turned off. And as a consequence, as a natural outcome of the modern feminist revolution, an adversarial relationship emerges between the male and the female. And then men find it more convenient to look for peace and happiness and love in the arms of another man. And women find it more convenient to look for peace and comfort and happiness in the arms of another woman. This is increasing all the time. But there is another disturbing part of the equation. Namely that the child wants to take men and transform them into women. Of course, he begins the process by getting them to shave off the bed. So if you shave off your bed, start growing it up. But it is possible that the food that we're eating, genetically modified food, in disturbing the genetic composition of food, we are, we are depriving of the male, depriving him of the sustenance he needs to keep his masculinity. And in putting hormones into the cows and the sheep for more milk and meat, we find that our baby boys are going to grow up looking more like girls, behaving more like girls. And so you have a situation in which eventually some men 
would be attracted to other men, these are the dominant, these are the submissive. And the world is moving headlong into that direction of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. That is going to end with destruction. Allah destroyed them and Allah will destroy these. There are many other signs. The Prophet spoke alayhi salatu wasalam about tall buildings that you'll find the naked barefooted shepherds competing in the construction of tall buildings. When you see that, that is a sign of the age which will eventually witness every town and every city being destroyed. He said women will be dressed and yet naked. That's already here. He said women will dress like men. And if you go to the bank, you'll see her in her jacket. I don't want her to be hurt by my talk tonight. I just want her to put on her thinking cap and recognize the validity of the argument being raised tonight. Don't feel offended by the lecture. She's dressed in a jacket. She's dressed in her trousers. She sometimes even has a tie on. She's dressing like a man. Fourteen hundred years ago, Nabi Muhammad said that that would happen. And when you see that sign, you know you're moving towards the destruction of every town and every city. What do you do? We live in an age with in which the feminist revolution has spawned a sexual revolution. Where sex is now f as freely available as sunshine. And Nabi Muhammad wasalam, told us where it's going to end. He said people are going to have sexual intercourse in public like donkeys. I don't think it has come to KL as yet, has it? <coughs> Sexual intercourse in public like donkeys. <coughs> Is that progress? And he said the most righteous man of that age would be one who would find two people engaged in sexual intercourse in public. And he would say to the man, can't you at least take her behind the wall? An age when there is no shame anymore. No shame. When you see that, and this has already emerged in European cities. And so tomorrow is coming to every city. And so it is not surprising that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should destroy every city and every town. He said that one man would have to maintain 50 women. You heard that before, haven't you? Which means that there is going to be a calamitous decline in the birth of baby boys. Which means that the male sperm is going to be damaged. The male chromosome which fertilizes the ovum would not be strong enough. And when you fail to produce a baby boy, then the default is a baby girl. Well, what's, what is it that is going to cause the male sperm to be damaged and weakened? The evidence is already in that the radiation which is inundating us in the cities from these cell phones, you, you know what a cell phone, you've seen a cell phone, yeah. the, the radiation from the cellular phones, the radiation from the laptop computers, from wireless computers, the radiation whenever you travel now, including in your blessed city of Kuala Lumpur. When you come to the airport, you're a visitor, you got to pass through a lane in which you are inundated with radiation. Uncle Sam said to do it, 
So Malaysia had to do it. Once Uncle Sam says do it, you have to do it. And so your, your airport is now damaging your own people. And if you refuse to pass through, you are punished. They say then, we're going to have to pat you down. And you know what they did to this girl in the United States? A woman had to pat her down now because she refused to pass through the scanner. And in that pat down, the woman's hand touched her private parts four times. Four times in a pat down. In other words, so that the news will spread, intimidation that you'll be afraid to have the pat down. Nobody wants that. So you prefer to go through the ele electronic scanner, the radiation and face the radiation. As a consequence of that radiation, not only a woman is at risk for cancer, but for our purposes here, the male sperm is damaged, sperm production. And so a tomorrow is coming when very few baby boys will be born and the world will be inundated with women, very few men. The Prophet said that one man would have to maintain 50 women. Is it not time for us to put on our thinking caps? I know durian is nice and tetarik is nice and roti chanai is nice, but is it not time to put on our thinking caps and think and ponder and reflect over the world in which we live today? How do we respond to these things? How do we respond to women dressed and yet naked? How do we respond to the economic oppression of slave wages? Huh? What should we do? Do we simply have roti chanai and go home and go to sleep? And remain comfortably aboard the comfort train? No. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said, Man ra'a munkaran, falyugayyirhu biyadi. If you see something that is evil, unjust, oppressive, wicked, wrong, stand up against it with your hand to change it. And if you cannot change it with your hand, then change it with your tongue. And if you cannot change it with your tongue, then change it with your heart. But that is the weakest stage of Iman. You don't remain there. No. No Muslim stays in a state of the weakest state of Iman. Well then what is there beyond that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibra'il alayhi salam to destroy a town for so many different reasons, oppression being one. Women naked, dressed and yet naked. Go and destroy that town. Jibra'il alayhi salam said, O oh Allah, but in that town there is your servant who is constantly in ibadah. What should we do with him? He knows that there is oppression all around him. He knows that there is nothing that he can do to change it. But he continues to live in that town and worshipping Allah. What to do with him? The Hadith of Qudsi. Allah says destroy him and destroy the town. And of course you know the Hadith. It's not the first time you're hearing it. No. And so when you see oppression, when you see decadence and wickedness, when you see women dressed and yet naked, and you know that you cannot stop it. No. Not with your hand and not with your tongue. 
You cannot change it. Allah does not want you to continue to live amongst them. If you continue to live amongst them, he will destroy you. He says, destroy him and destroy the town. This is not from Imran Hussein. No, this is Hadith al-Qudsi. And so all the towns and all the cities will be destroyed tomorrow. And even if there are in the towns and cities those who are the servants of Allah, constantly worshipping Him, even they will be destroyed. But there is an opening. In Surah Ali Imran, the angels are taking to Jahannam those whose souls are sent to Jahannam. And then the angels pause and they ask them, Fima kuntum? What happened? What happened that you landed in this mess? So they replied and they said, Kunna mustada'afina fil up. We were helpless. We couldn't do anything else. To which the angel replied and asked, Alam takun abdullahi wasi'ah futuhajiru fi Was Allah's earth not wide? That instead of living amongst the oppressors as they are living in the United States today, the whole Muslim community living in the United States, living in Britain today, living in France today, living in Belgium today, living in all the oppressors living in Singapore today. Was Allah's earth not wide? That you could have made hijrah to some place on Allah's earth where we would not be living with these conditions? Huh? Into the hellfire. This is Surah to Ali Imran. Except those who were truly helpless. They were in the dust. They had no alternative but to remain where they were. Allah knows them. And they would not suffer Jahannam. We now turn to the functions of the Muslim village. And number one is to escape from divinely ordained punishment and destruction which in my opinion, and I am one of those who have been studying Islamic eschatology for the last 15-20 years. I have written Jerusalem in the Quran, many of you have already read it. It is already translated into Bahasa, but we ran out of copies of being reprinted now. Jerusalem in the Quran is the textbook of Islamic eschatology. If you read that book, you'll understand the reality of the world today. And then there is my book entitled Surah Al-Kaf in the Modern Age, in which we take Surah Al-Kaf or Kafi and we get the explanation in Surah Al-Kafi which allows us to understand the world today. And then the third book, which is the last book I've written, entitled An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern What is the only copy? It's the only book. There is no other book other than this. I am not boasting when I say the literature in the market on Gog and Magog is fit for Disneyland. It's not boasting on my part. So I suggest that you read these three books. They are available somewhere in the hall here. You just have to find where it is. Read these three books so that you can get the understanding of why Allah is going to destroy the world. Why? And when we turn to the Muslim village, we're doing that with the hope that Allah will protect us. <coughs> when we go to the Muslim village, it must be remotely located. How will we know that we are remotely located? This is the right kampong. How would we know? Answer? 
once your cell phone can work, tabule, go look for another village. Because you are escaping from the radiation. So that the boys, the baby boys who grow up in this village, when they get married, these baby boys can give you, these men can give you a baby boy. Women, young women are going to love our village, I tell you. Because every woman wants to have a baby boy. A husband from KL won't be able to give you a baby boy tomorrow. <laughs> no. So you're going to have to head to the kampung, outside of the radiation. Secondly, the village must produce its own food. And it must be food as doreen by Allah, natural food. Because the food not only provides nutrition, but the food also has medicinal properties. In that food is what the male needs to remain a man. In the food. And when you tamper with the genetic composition of the food, the food can no longer nourish the semen, the, semen, the sperm. So we need to produce organic food from natural seeds. How will we know that the food that we are producing is not GM, genetically modified? Huh? We don't have the money to send our seeds to a laboratory and pay so much money to have it examined. And we don't even trust the laboratories also. The answer is you have to engage in honey production. Honey production. If you can produce honey, you know that your plants are proper. The bees will not go to genetically modified seeds and plants for honey. No. And it is because GM plants are escalating around the world today that honey production is dropping around the world. Allah expects us wherever we are to establish the deen, ikamatun deen. We cannot establish the deen today because we do not have the khalifa. And we do not have the khilafa state, we have the modern secular state. Well then what do we do? We know that the khilafa is coming back one day. And this modern secular state is going back into the garbage bin from where it came out in the first place. The Khilafah state is coming back tomorrow. They can't stop it. Don't bother with their noise. The Khilafah state is coming back because Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam told us so. Kaifa antum? Iza nazala alaykum no maryam. وَإِمَامُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ Sahih Bukhari What a wonderful time that would be when the son of Mary descends amongst you and your Imam, your Khalifa, your Amirul Mu'mineen would be from within your own ranks. The Khilafah is coming back. But until that time, what do we do? We know from Islamic eschatology that it's only when Imam al-Mahdi comes that the Khilafah will be restored. But Hizb al-Tahrir does not agree with that. So Hizb al-Tahrir is waging a struggle for the restoration of the Khilafah. And we say, brothers, carry on if you want. Carry on. Carry on. We admire you. We say you cannot establish the macro. The macro. So we say, let us establish the micro. So in the kampong is going to be the micro khilafa. A small community established in accordance with the deen of Islam. In the Muslim village, we have to have a free and a fair market. Nowhere in the world today is there a free and a fair market. Nowhere. 
In a free and a fair market, you'd have money which is halal. You know this is the age of Sharia compliance, eh? So our International Islamic University invited me a few days ago to speak on Islam and the international monetary system. And there are lots of professors present. So I said, well, in the same way that we have Sharia compliant, this and that and the other, what about money? Huh? Shouldn't the money that we're using also be Sharia compliant? The money that we're using is bogus. The money that we're using is fraudulent. The money that we're using is haram. And the halal money is in the Quran, it is in the Sunnah. It is the gold dinar and the silver dirham. But I want to make a comment tonight to those who are so actively involved in bringing back the gold dinar and the silver dirham. And mashallah, 15 years ago when we started talking, they laughed at us. <laughs> They're not laughing anymore today. 15 years ago we said that the US dollar will collapse. It has to collapse. They laughed at us then. They're not laughing anymore now. 15 years ago we said that when the US dollar collapses, it will bring down the whole world of paper money with it. And then electronic money will take over. Money you can't see, money you can't touch. They laughed at it. They're not laughing anymore. Because the electronic money has already taken over. The majority of major transactions in the world today. And the paper is only used for microtransactions now. Hmm? Bogus and fraudulent was the paper money. Electronic money is worse than paper money. It is shilp to take a piece of paper and I can speak on this subject because I have studied international monetary economics in two universities. So I know my subject. You take a piece of paper and you print a picture and you put a number and you assign to that piece of paper an entirely fictitious value. <laughs> and you, you, you're trying to create wealth out of nothing. If the donkeys accept the paper, if the donkeys accept the paper, then all that you need is to have the machine and the paper and the ink. And you could buy all the oil of Saudi Arabia. Hmm? Tell me what will Allah do with this Ummah on Judgment Day? When we allowed ourselves to be ripped off like this. And even when someone comes to you and teaches you the subject, and he does it for 15 years, and the whole thing is collapsing now, yet we cannot get fatwa. Yet it is still being defended by fatwa. What will Allah do? To a people who have eyes and yet cannot see, who have ears and yet cannot hear, who have hearts and yet do not understand. But thank Allah that there is a movement now to mint gold in ours and silver dirhams. But I have a message for them tonight. Here in Shah Alam at the Blue Masjid. And that is that Allah doesn't want halal and haram to sleep on the same bed. No. When truth comes into the world, truth must challenge falsehood. <laughs> Truth must defeat falsehood. And so it is not sufficient that you should just mint the gold dinars and silver dirhams and sell it to people and make a mint on your own heart. That's not what we want. We want that the truth should challenge falsehood. 
that the bogus and fraudulent and haram paper money should get out. Our project is like that. Because we're not going to bring gold dinar and silver dirham to sleep on the same bed with the ringgit. No. And with the US dollar, no. Ours is different. We want to build a market. And in our market, only halal money is committed. Only the dinar and dirham which are in the Quran. Only the dinar and dirham which are in the sunnah. And we will prohibit the use of any bogus and fraudulent money in our market. This is a different approach from yours. And tonight we ask you to open your eyes. And so the market in the Muslim village would be a market of money, which is halal. Already the heavens will be smiling. And in our market, you cannot come to lend money on interest. No banks. And in our market, you cannot come with your so-called murabaha. <laughs> to lend on interest while pretending that it is a sale. Which is what the Islamic banks are doing. Selling on credit at a price higher than the cash price. And if you say I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay. I'm not going to pick up any boxing gloves with you. You defer with me, all right. No problem. But if you come at me with boxing gloves, to say that this man is misguiding the people, when he says that the Islamic banks are engaged in backdoor riba, if you come at me with boxing gloves, then I will try to show patience for as long as I can show. And when I cannot show any more patience, I'll say, come, come, come! And let us both pray to Allah to punish with the greatest possible punishment. Curse! With the greatest curse! Until judgment day, whosoever is wrong in this matter, come on if you feel that you are so correct that I am wrong. Come on. But I hope and pray I never have to do that. I hope and pray I never have to do that. If they differ with me, okay. You have your view, I have my view, and we go our ways. That's it. The Muslim village has to have a special place not only for the market, but for our women. <laughs> because when women are oppressed, the heavens weep. So every single right that Allah gave to women <laughs> must be protected in the village. In the economy today, because of riba, because of the collapse of morals, women are suffering more than they have suffered before. Children are suffering more than they've suffered before. And the feminist revolution is exploiting that to wage war on Islam. Yes, it is war on Islam. It's like George Bush's war on terror. Everybody except the governments know that war on terror is war on Islam. Similarly, the feminist movement is waging war on Islam by talking about how Muslim men are behaving. And so in the Muslim village, we show you this is Islam. This is Islam. For example, here in this masjid, there are women present. I can see them, they can see me. There are many masajid in the world today where women are not allowed. Not allowed. In this masjid, the women are at back and the men at the front. This is a sunnah. There are many masajid in the world today where the women are not put at the back. They are in a balcony, they're in a basement, they're in an annex, anywhere but not behind the men. 
In this masjid, the women can see the imam standing. They are part of the jama'ah. Many masajid in the world today, they put a barrier. So the women cannot see. They can only hear. But in the Muslim village, the women at the back and the men at the front in the masjid. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, when the women go down in sijda, they must remain in sijda longer than men. Why? Why? Because some of the men may not have sufficient cloth to cover themselves. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim, check it out. Check it out. And so women must remain in sijda longer than men. Which means that the women were at the back and the men were at the front. He said the best row for the men is the first. And the one with the greatest evil is the last. Shaf. And the best row for the woman is the last. And the one with the greatest shaf is the first. Meaning that as the masjid fills up, the last row of the men and the first row of the women will be very close. Hmm? Not that you put the men in kale and put the women in shalom. <laughs> so a lot of space in between. So in the Muslim village, the rights of a woman will be restored in the masjid. In the Muslim village, any man who does not maintain his wife, the village will take action against him because she'll come and complain. Who does not maintain his children, the village will take action against you. You might even be expelled from the village. So that the rights of women and children in the village would be protected. Every woman who comes to the village and who says, I want a husband, the village has to find a husband for her. Somebody has to marry her. Oh, sorry. Somebody has to make an offer of marriage because she has the right to refuse. And so there will be no woman in the village who is without a husband, who wants a husband. And so where will men get women for haram relations? Huh? Not in the village. Because every single woman in the village is either married or unmarried but does not want a husband. And therefore, sexual relations in the village will return to something that will be beautiful and something that will be free from haram. I want to end with one last, I have to leave out a lot of material. Why the Muslim village? Remember he said that when there is no food, Subhanallah will maintain you, will provide sustenance. Alhamdulillah will provide sustenance. That's coming tomorrow. So it requires us to think. And the answer is there in Surah al kahfi That when a young man fled, from the city to the cave. <coughs> Allah put them to sleep and they slept for 300 years. How did they get food? How were they sustained for 300 years? Huh? Well, we know that there's a hint, there's a hint that the sunlight entered the cave in the morning on the right side and the sunlight entered the cave in the evening from the left side and that the bodies were rolling towards the sunlight so that the sunlight or light had something to do with it light 
through light it is possible for them to get sustenance, light. But it is possible that light is only a vehicle and something comes with the light, like a passenger in a taxi and light is a taxi. After they had slept for three hundred years, they woke up. And Allah says, I woke them up. I woke them up after three hundred years to teach them the subject of time. So one of them asked, how long were you here? And the other said, well, I've been here for a day or a part of a day. And that is surprising because if you slept for three hundred years, then your fingernails should be as long as from Ampang Point to KLCC. <laughs> huh? And your beard? So can they see? No. Even though they had slept for three hundred years, they were the same age as when they slept. So they had not aged biologically. So they had not spent the three year, 300 years in biological time. Are there other worlds of space and time? Yes, says the Quran. He it is who has created for you everything in the material universe. He then directed his attention to the skies and he fashioned them as seven samawat, seven worlds of space and time, seven samawat. And so now we know that during those three hundred years these young men were not in this world of space and time, but they were in the Samawat. And when women love the Samawat, because you don't need cosmetics there, you don't grow old. You remain forever young. So the young men were in the Samawat during the three hundred years. Don't you agree with me? Huh? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. No, the young men were here in this world of space and time because morning and evening is time, isn't it? And rolling and rolling back is space. So now we hit the parallax. There is indisputable evidence that the young men were not in this world of space and time because they did not age biologically. And there's also indisputable evidence that the young men were most firmly in this world of space and time. So they went both at the same time. So there was movement back and forth continuously between this world of space and time and that Samawat. And Surah al Kaf is telling us the secret of survival when no rain will fall. No rain. That it is possible to move back and forth, back and forth, between this world, the material universe, and the Samawat. What is the vehicle of movement? The light. The light. Because the sunlight entered morning and evening. And Allah says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ab. What is common to the material universe and to the Samawat is new. New. So it is with new that you will travel back and forth. Back and forth. <coughs> but Noor is a taxi. Who is sitting in the taxi to go to the other world? I want to turn now to Surah Al Mulk. Because the answer is there. I found this answer a few years ago. 
in Surah Al-Mulk and Shaitan caused me to forget it. <laughs> Shaitan caused me to forget it. And this morning in this surah, the Imam recited from Surah Al-Mulk. Imam doesn't know of course that Allah caused him to choose that surah. And I was able to get back the answer. Yes, Salat al fajr this morning. Alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin tibaqa. Allah it is who has created the seven worlds of space and time alongside each other. Ma tara fi khalqi rahmani min tafawud. You will not see you will not find, you will not see anywhere in the Samawat, anywhere in the material universe, any defect. Oh, it looks as though Allah wants us to see. He wants us to explore the Samawat and the up. And when we do so, we will not find any defect. Ma tara fi khalqi rahmani min tafawud farji'i al-basara hal tara min futur Return with your basira. <laughs> and so the passenger in the taxi is basira. Basira. Return with your basira. Do you find any any defect? Thumma rujil basara kamatayni al khalibirayn.